family. How come an ex prisoner who was accused in rape becoming the death of the Pharaoh? What is the game changer? The same question how come that the leader of a group that were suspected as uh, spies? in Egypt <coughs> convinced the deputy of Pharaoh that not that he's only innocent, but he's convincing the deputy of Pharaoh and actually he's breaking his soul and breaking all the walls that were around him. And the answer to the same to the two questions is the same answer. A very good speech. The speech that Joseph delivered in the presence of Pharaoh, and the speech that Judah is delivering in the presence of Joseph. And in order to make this point as clear as I can, I would like to create a common language among all of us and to bring you into the uh, class of, of Frederick. And did you go for a decade? Uh, classes of rhetoric in the academic world or outside the academic world and when I'm teaching I'm always somehow I'm, I'm being dragged into the story of Joseph and his brothers in order to, to uh, explain my point. So the first thing that we know about a good speaker is that he is well organized and short. And he is short. <laughs> the Americans call it ki KISS. Keep it short and simple. And I believe that I will give you also a few tools and a few formulas for those who are going to deliver some sermons. And uh, this is one of the most important uh, lessons that every rabbi or pastor should know, <coughs> that you have to keep it short and simple. Now, sometimes you have to write it down in order that uh, people will, uh, will, will be able to uh, understand what you want to say. But um, you have to be well organized. So how come that Mr. Netanyahu is delivering a speech to the joint session of the Congress, and he's also writing in his hand, and you can see also there are some pages that are printed. The main reason is that someone, there was a secretary that printed it in the Prime Minister's office before he went to the US. But on the way, he thought that he had to add something else. And there is another point that he wants that somebody whispered him or somebody gave him a good suggestion and told him, you have to think, rethink what you want to say. This is, for example, a wonderful picture. Night before he delivered his speech to the joint uh, session of the Congress, Netanyahu already, uh, as you know, is a, is a well known speaker. He was invited three times to deliver a speech in the joint session of the Congress. And the night before, you can see that he's sitting with another. 10 people that will give him the last few corrections and the fine tuning for his text in order to understand better um, how he can deliver the message to the American people or to uh, what? Effective. And an effective, an effective uh, thing. We know that sometimes people are writing for other people. For example, the, the biggest winner is, I think, in the last uh, election campaign in, in the U.S. Uh, was Michelle Obama. She was discovered as a talented speaker, not that far from her husband, and she has uh, a speechwriter, like many other politicians. The name of this uh, speechwriter is Sarah Horowitz, who was the former speechwriter of Hillary Clinton, and. Um, she wrote a wonderful, wonderful um, speech for Hillary Clinton when she lost in the campaign to, to uh, Barack Obama. And then she went to work with, uh, with uh, Michelle Obama. And after all, when we are talking about um, delivering the speech, we understand that the main issue is that we are talking and we are usually we are connecting it to leadership. What is the meaning of being the leader? And being a leader, like Joseph would be, and like, Jude like Judah is, he is in his family, is to take the people, 
like Henry Kissinger just said, the task of the leader is to get these people from where they are to where they've never been before. I mean, I have to take you, not only in the physical aspect, like Moses took, uh, uh, took the people from Egypt to the uh, land of Canaan. I mean, sometimes it's taking them in the, in the aspect of, of, of their state of mind. Now, everyone can be a leader. You don't have to be a prime minister or uh, to be a king in order to be a leader. Sometimes you can be a leader and you can pull the people and to bring them to a, a new point of view. Even though you are just a young man who has no status, like Joseph, who is just went out of the jail. And the main thing is that you change, like uh, there was a four unknown and forgotten um, um, writer, John Tversky, and he said, leader seeks to change the individual by changing the public. Educator wants to change the, pub, the people by changing the individual. So sometimes when you want, like a captain who is trying to to reshape the, the course of, of, um, of the, the ship, you have to think, um, what is the meaning of your word? And the meaning of the word is that if you are giving an order in the bridge, it also affects on the sailor that is down next to the engine. And this is what Joseph is doing, and this is what also Judah is doing. Now, the foundation stones of the public speaking are three. Athos, Logos, and Pathos. And by the way, until today, uh, it's like uh, many other uh, many other rules that we know in, in the geometry and in engineering and in math. They are working even 2,500 years later. And the same Aristotelian rules are working today, even for the speechwriters, for the presidents and kings and and uh, prime ministers. And the ethos means, who is the speaker's resume before he entered to deliver a speech? And if you remember, when, when uh, Pharaoh is waking up from his uh, nightmare, or from his uh, dreams, and he can't figure out what to do, somebody is giving him an ethos of someone. And one of his ministers, you have the, the Bible next to you, right? Mm -hmm. Can I have also one? Sorry, I'm not asking. <laughs> and please open in the right after the. So it's not No, it's a thing. Okay. Right after the. It's chapter 41. And the chief butler is spoken to Pharaoh in phrase 9. Can I read it in Hebrew or in English? What is it preferable? Old German. German. What? Old, old German. Old German? Okay. <laughs> and from phrase 9 to, uh, uh, to 13, we can see the Athos. וידבר שר המשקים את פרעה לאמור את חטאי אני מזכיר היום. פרעה קצף על עבדיו וייתן אותי במשמר בית שר הטבחים, אותי ואת שר העופים, ונחלמה חלום בלילה אחד אני והוא, איש בפתרון חלומו חלמנו. And here he is the, the ethos of Joseph, phrase 12, ושם איתנו נער עברי עבד לשר הטבחים. It's a young man, it's in Hebrew, he's a servant, and probably he's not saying, it's not written why he is in jail, he's not saying, right? He was accused in, in rape. Doesn't mean, he didn't mention it, but this is part of his ethos. And then he's continuing, and we told him, and they interpreted it to us, to our dream, to each man according to his dream. He did, uh, he did manage to solve it, and what happened? What he said just happened. Uh, I have a quick question. Is not the ethos supposed to be because Joseph has the capacity to interpret dreams, he is, uh, 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 
uh, there is a small nuance between like uh, the, 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 what people know about someone and what he is able to <coughs> do. Because uh, Aristotle says that the ethos cannot be in rhetoric 1.2.4, he says that rhetoric cannot, the ethos cannot be by, uh, something by a preconceived notion that people have about the, spe the, 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 the speaker. But after all, nobody knows until this second about that prisoner in the palace of Pharaoh. Nobody knows about him. Nobody cares about him. He can stay there for, for uh, until the end of his life. Yes. Right? And then somebody is building an ethos. By the way, the ethos is not that positive. On the contrary, it's very positive. How come we didn't hear of his talented dream solver? Because he's, we found him. Because, he, the because he's a slave. Because he's a prisoner. Uh, because if he was so talented, he should have been among the magicians of Pharaoh. Ah, so, so it's a criticism on the who? No, no, it's not a criticism. It's the way. Like you say, I found wonderful wine. Well, in a ink wine store that no one knows about. Okay. And this is only, I don't, how come otherwise no one knows about it? So it's, I think it's about the ethos. It's, it's, it is By the way, the, com right, the commentaries are, are dealing between themselves. Is this a, a con could be considered as a positive? Or as a negative description of Joseph, can we see and can we say he's just a, he's such a gifted boy, or can we say there is a someone he has a gift but he is a troublemaker, and this is the main reason why he's there. It doesn't sound like this. It depends on the tone, right? No, the older, the older boy. If he he's young, if he's so he's un. Listen, he's young, so he's unexperienced. Right. He's a slave, so he has no status. He is in jail, so he is a criminal. Right, but then you say... There are all good reasons why not to listen to him. But, I'm telling you, he is gifted. So, there is, a, there is a positive aspect and there is a negative aspect. Now, beside the ethos, there is the logos. What you are going to say. And this we will do later when we will see the speech itself. The speech itself. Delivering by, uh, delivered by Joseph, and then the pathos. That sometimes we, uh, we, we lack it, we have to imagine it. What was the way that Joseph uses, what was the tone of the music when Joseph delivered the speech or when Judas spoke to, his, uh, uh, to Joseph. Now, um, there are a lot of speakers all over the world. Every September, the leaders of the, of the world are gathering in the General Assembly of the UN. The Economist uh, just, uh, just published uh, a year ago um, an average of the speech length at the UN General Assembly. And many leaders are delivering speeches. You can see, the more the darker is the state, the longer the speech. So you can see the longer speakers are the Iran, Israel, Turkey, United States, some of the states of uh, South America. And I can tell you that one of the leaders who has the most significant problem when he is coming to deliver the speech is Mr. Netanyahu. Why? Because he has a problem. By the way, it's the same problem that Angela Merkel has. The ethos is well known. Everybody knows that. There are ages in the politics. Their state is all in the, in the headlines. Sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. So, it's not, there is no surprise. Let's say, it's not the, the new chancellor of, of uh, Austria. You know how old is he? 37. 31. 31. So it's a young guy who came to the neighborhood, everybody wants to meet him and everybody wants to, to listen to him, or to uh, the president of France, he's also a young man, he's also just 39, and you say, okay, it's a, it's a good reason why to listen to him. But when you, are, when you have a good ethos, sometimes it could be a pirate's victory, because everybody knows you. And by the way, when Netanyahu is going to deliver a speech in the UN, just imagine what will be his logos, what he's going to speak about. 
probably the Iranian nuclear program. And if it would ask not to be talked about it, it will talk probably about other issues such as Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So why, after all, people is listening to him? Because he has the pathos. Every good leader, every good speaker has to think not only about who is he, and not only about what he is saying, but also about the way he is saying it. And sometimes it's by illustrating, but the main, the main issue is by being unexpected. Unexpected. And when you are delivering a sermon, or when you are trying to, to deliver a speech, you have to be unexpected. And when, uh, I'm, uh, when we continue, and between the layers, the historical layers of the Greek contribution of, uh, of Aristotelian uh, rules and the ideas that gave by Rome, you can see that there are five criteria to judge a speech. First of all, is it original? Is it original? When someone is coming and, and delivering a speech and is saying in the opening sentence, guys, you always know what I'm saying in this part of the year, in this time of the year. So nobody's not going to listen to him, right? Why? Because it's, he's saying, guys, I'm not original. Don't spend your time on me. The, thing, the other thing is how to organize your speech. And when I'm saying organizing, I'm talking about three aspects. The opening sentence, the closing sentence, and the body of the speech. And sometimes, when you open the sentence, you can track your uh, listeners to... Uh, let's try the low video. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, our guests, my fellow Americans, we are fortunate to be alive at this moment in history. This is the opening sentence when President Clinton uh, delivered his last uh, uh, State, of the Union. State of the Union speech. Thank you. And he is trying to summarize his term, his double term. Now, he is a Democratic president. Half of the House is Republican, half of the House is Democratic. The Republicans said, What are you talking about? The Republicans, the, the Democrats said, tell us what we get and we didn't know. Now, this is an opening sentence for a speech that is, its length is an hour and a half. We are fortunate to be alive at this moment in history. Now, this is something that is track, is, is curious, right? And then he's delivering another paragraph that establishes itself. Never before has our nation enjoyed at once so much prosperity and social progress with so little internal crisis and with so few external threats. Never before have we had such a blessed opportunity and therefore such a profound obligation to build the more perfect union of our founders' dreams. We began the new century with over 20 million new jobs, the fastest economic growth in more than 30 years, the lowest unemployment rates in 30 years, the lowest poverty rates in 20 years, 
the lowest African American and Hispanic unemployment rates on record, the first back-to-back -back surpluses in 42 years, and next month America will achieve the longest period of economic growth in our entire history. Do you believe him? Yeah. yeah, why not? Why not? What? He never lied, isn't it? He has a good reputation. Okay. Now, the main reason why people uh, believed him because after all he gave he gave the data. And uh, the data that he brought with him was well organized. And the opening sentence was had a backup with a paragraph with a lot of data. And we, we, we have this uh, chance to believe data that being delivered us. And we will see in a moment that Joseph is doing the same thing. And it's not only that, I also have to think about the style, which means how do I fit this, the, the content to the audience? And then I have to memorize it, and I have to think what is the meaning and how do I build it in the, in, the, in the way that I would be able to memorize it. And then, how do I operate it? I mean, what is in the, the, the bottom line? How do I do it? Now, usually, we used to say, just a second, that the most easiest way to deliver a speech is by building it through the timeline. And, I th and to keep it like it was mentioned before, very short. If some of you uh, visited in uh, Washington DC and you get to the wonderful temple that was built to, in the memory of, of President Lincoln, you can see that on the side of the wall there is a speech. This is considered to be the Gettysburg Address. The Gettysburg Address is a eulogy that President Lincoln delivered after, uh, in, during the Civil War and it was built precisely in, in the very shape, the same you can see in many other speeches that I would like to show you in a few seconds. And it began with the word, with the, with the past. Four scores and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It began with the past. And then he moved to the present. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. And then it continue to the, to the future. The world will little note, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. So it began from the past, through the present, to the future. And sometimes when you use the timeline and you use it as a basic as a basic formula for speech and you said for example 50 years ago something happened now we are remarking it and we have to make conclusion and we have to make our lesson for tomorrow acting it's beginning from the past to the future by the way sometimes you can listen to, to um, uh, those who are delivering uh, Sevens or courses in the, uh, the university, and for example, that you can hear a professor who said, "Listen, until the end of this semester, you all be uh, qualified to do A, B, C, but therefore we have to begin today with A." And don't worry, I know that it's considered to be a very difficult course, but I built a very easy. Uh, a way to, to, to learn it. So I began from the future to the, to the present, to the past. <coughs> Over that, we can say that if you want to build, uh, to build a speech, the Americans called it 4P. What is 4P? It's a formula. By the way, all the speech writers are working with formulas. Formulas and tools. What is 4P? Position, problem, possibilities, Proposal. Pericles. You can hear it. What? Pericles. 
And you can see that sometimes, you can see it in political campaigns until today, all over the globe, and you can see it in many other places, and then we'll show you in a second that it's also working in the book of Genesis. Well, how does it work? Position. The position I have to explain you what is the status of you name it, the economy, the state of the, the union, the state of whatever it is, and I will explain you that this is something that it happened now because something that ha happened a few days before or years before. For example, let's begin the position. The position is that we are sitting here today here at Bar Ilan University. Why? Because we all gathered from all over the globe in order to in, in order to meet each other and to learn together. So I'm I'm describing something that happened now in the present and based on the on the past. Now I had to explain sometimes to the people why the position is problematic. Because sometimes you don't even understand. The people don't understand and I have to explain them. Listen. The position is that there is a socio-economical gap between parts of the society. This is the situation. How come? Policies of the government during the years. Okay, who said that it's problematic? There are some people who are well wealthy, there are some people who are poor. Some people are poor, some people are, are wealthy. I'm saying no. If we want to be a just uh, society, we have to be uh, those who are taking care for the poor. And then we have a few possibilities how to solve it. By the way, sometimes I can have only one possibility. And there, after I bring the buffet of possibilities, I'm proposing a proposal. The same, now the Americans like to think that they invented it. But as you can see, we have the same thing in Genesis chapter 41, just in front of you. Please see um, in uh, phrase chapter 41, uh, phrase uh, 25. Okay? It's page 41. Page uh, uh, 15, sorry. Okay? No, it's 15 in the uh, old version. 18, 16, no. Okay. So, but it's still Genesis 41. It's still Genesis 41, 2,000 later. And let's begin from the beginning. In phrase 25, when Joseph is listening to, to Pharaoh, he hear and he said the opening sentence. Well, what is the opening sentence? The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now, just imagine that Pharaoh said, Okay, I've heard you. I have enough, I have enough advisors who already tried to solve my, my dreams. Even after this one sentence, everything is now clear. Why? Because he said, listen, the dream is one, it's not two. And I want to tell you another thing. It's not an ordinary dream. This is a message from the Lord. Now, this is the, the uniqueness of a good opening of a speech. And it makes Pharaoh curious. What do you want to say? How come that the, these two dreams are just one dream? How come that it's considered to be a message from the Lord? And then he's describing to Pharaoh what is happening now. Here, this is phrase uh, 26. The seven good kind are seven years. The seven good years are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. The seven empty years lasted with the east. Wind shall be seven years for mine. This is, and now we return again and say it again. He repeated. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. When God is about to Yeshua, to Yeshua unto Pharaoh. Now, he explained, Behold, there are come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. So it's wonderful. So the position 
is wonderful. What is the position? We are going to have seven good years. No, this is the problem. I have to explain you, Pharaoh. This is the problem. And the main issue is that you have to be prepared. And what is the problem? People can think that if they are in the middle of seven years, seven good years, they won't come seven bad years. And you have to be prepared because this is what a responsible leader is doing. He's getting his people and his land to the bad years. That probably would come. And then he don't give him, he doesn't give him one uh, or uh, a few, he doesn't give him a few uh, options to, to pick. Why? He's not saying, listen, you have a few possibilities. He's giving him only one possibility. But what is the possibility? This is a, a phrase 33. Ve'ata, now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. So actually, he is offering himself to the position and he said, listen, I know already to analyze the, the status, what happened now. I even have the option to give you a 7 years or 14 years plan to the future. You can rely on me. I'm wise, I'm humble, but I know what, who I am and I, will, I know what are my abilities. And therefore, I'm asking from you to count on me. And he said as follows, and he bring him on basic details, what is the seven years program? This is phrase 34. Let her do this, and let him appoint officers all over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven times years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. So he brings him all the idea. And then he said, And the food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. So the proposal is the possibility. There is only one possibility. Sometimes a leader has to say to the people, Guys, we have nothing else to do. For example, when uh, Churchill is delivering his first speech as Prime Minister and he promised his people blood, toil, tears and sweat and say, guys, there is no other way. I don't know any other way. This is it. And I'm telling you the truth. We have a situation. It's problematic. We have only one possibility. And then he would continue, Churchill would continue with this line because he understands, like many other leaders in the history, that the main ammunition that he has as a leader is his words. After all, the speeches are delivered by him uh, uh, in the assistance of the BBC. So, when you can see uh, uh, the speech of Joseph in front of Pharaoh, you can understand how come an ex-prisoner slave, young man, unqualified, without any experience, in a second, gain in the lottery and get the position of the deputy of Pharaoh. And in the end, you can see this is phrase 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. Now, since it's a dictatorship, and it's in the eyes of all the servants, all the servants uh, think the same thing. Now, Joseph Pulitzer, that uh, after him named the, the famous uh, prize for good journalists, or qualified journalists, said his father, if you want to know how to bring a good story, a good article, a good argument, put it before them briefly so they will read it. Clearly, so they will appreciate it. Picturesly, so they will remember it, and above all, accurately, so they will be guided by its light. The same ideas that you can see today in the newspapers, you can see in the speech delivered by Joseph. 
But you can see it even better when we are talking about the second speech in the story, and this is the speech of Judah. What did you say? Sorry, isn't it after all astonishing that verse 37 happens? Because, well, it, is, it, it may be a well-ordered speech, what he said, but it is not a great speech, what Joseph did here, I would say. He explains the dreams, and the Pharaoh could have said, you're just crazy, of course you want to get out of jail. I know. And, and you, I have and no will proof. tell me whatever you, whatever you want. And tell me whatever you want. I have no proof at all that what you say is from God or is or you go back to jail. Or go back to yeah. You, so, so, so how do you explain what, what, that? Why do you think, Surya, that this is such a convincing speech, really? Mm -hmm. You continue. You can see in phrase 38. By the way, pay attention. In the phrase 38 and in 39. The beginning is the same beginning, mm -hmm. right? And Pharaoh said, and Pharaoh said, right? Uh, Professor Zakovich from, from Hebrew University wrote a, a famous article about it and said that when you can see a phrase after phrase that someone is saying, it's op the same opening, vayomer, vayomer, it means that after the first, the first sentence, people were wondering what to say. People didn't even know what to answer. Because in the beginning, you can see, Fayomer Paro el Abadab, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom, whom the Spirit of God is? So in the beginning, what Pharaoh is, what is the, the explanation of Pharaoh? Guys, this is a man who has a God of Spirit. And people are quiet. Why? Because they can say, listen, I also have the God of the Spirit. Who said that he is better than I am? But people are not there to say anything against Pharaoh. And then you can see phrase 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as good hath through these all these, there is none so discreet and wise as the Lord. Which means you are so wise and clever. I'm not saying that you are just have the force, the goddess force like many other uh, religious advisors have. You have also the, the tactical aspect, you have the strategic aspect, the logistic aspect. So you understand and you, can just, you don't know how to solve dreams. You know how to explain them and to get from them the meaning, the, 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 the right interpretation that we, in the real world, can make a few decisions. And therefore, you make, you make a decision on the spot. Phrase 40. You are now my deputy, right? And then he gave... I gave it to Joseph the, in phrase 41. Uh, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt, and he gave him his, his ring and all the coronation. So I think it's a, it's a combination of being, bring something with a connection to God on the one hand, but again, I see that you are wise, and I see that you are clever, and then you know how to handle the crisis. So I can put you. By the way, I will say this in a footnote. In the research of communication, one of the most challenging parts is to find out the influence of, of uh, communication. Can we know if the campaign is working? Sometimes it's very hard to say. Here is one of the main, the, 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 in the story of Joseph, you can see that there is a speech and it does something to the people. Sometimes you can see that uh, there are speeches throughout the history uh, that take time, it takes time until it's, it's doing something. For example, in, in, in August 1963, Martin Luther King is delivering the speech, I have a dream. What happened in the day after he's uh, telling his dreams? Nothing. Nothing happened. It, but it took 50 years and the, and the 50th anniversary of that speech talking about the dream was led was led by <coughs> by President Obama. Yes, please. 
Yes, I have another question because, um, well, if I um, understood it right, you say that Joseph's speech is a speech of rhetorical devices and very, very good structure and very, very well like prepared. Right. right. So, but for example, in verse 24, the Pharaoh said in the end, he speaks about the magicians and he says, the aim magid me, so there was nobody who can declare it to me. So maybe isn't it more about really about declaring someone who who is able to magid, and then it's more like simple say what the dreams are about and tell me so that I can t um, take all the preparations. And it's not about he says not he says magid. He says not nobody he wants to be he, he doesn't want to be convinced, but rather be informed. So I would say Joseph. So what is the, what is the meaning of aim magid? As you can understand it. So I understood it like he just once, like Joseph did, explain the dreams, interpret them, and say what he can do to prepare himself. And that's what he does. And he, it, I, in my opinion, it's not full of rhetorical devices. It's very simple. There were seven cows, meaning seven years. So it, it, from my point of view, it's, it's very simple, really. And I, but maybe you can convince me. Okay. The magicians, the magicians, we don't know what they did tell. We don't, we didn't know, we don't see the, their explanations. No, but we know what the Pharaoh wants. Pharaoh, no, Pharaoh said, I asked them, and nobody declared. Now, uh, some of, uh, of the translations of En Magid Lee is, nobody convinced me. Which means, I've heard some solutions. <coughs> After all, there are magicians. And Pharaoh is asking a question. And he is asking a very good question. It's a strategical and political question. What we should do, because after all, if Pharaoh is getting a dream, it's not like I have a dream. And I have to think what is the meaning of it. Now, perhaps the Midrash is saying that it is offering a few options what the magician said. But like you said, it's well organized. Sometimes what makes a good speech is being just well organized. But can you give me an example for the rhetorical devices, for example? Yes. The opening sentence was a brilliant one. He squeezed all the message in the first sentence. Because in the beginning, he said, Period. First of all, the opening sentence, He's squeezing all the, all the message. Secondly, the logos. The way he built all the explanation. There is position, there is problem. You have one possibility. And in the bottom line, I can say that I know who is fixed to this position. I am, say Joseph. I am the, he's, but he's brilliant enough not to say it uh, specifically. He does not say, listen, like, like Alexander said, Listen, I want you to uh, take me out of jail. He's doing it in a very, very uh, polite and very wise way. And therefore, Pharaoh is getting an idea. He said, you know what? First of all, you are not like all the magicians. You have touch from the God. And on the other hand, you, also you can also give me the, the meaning of what I am saying. Okay? Yes, please. How would you describe the aim of this? Convince to solve or owing to show the program to get out the jail and get a minor job in the old school or to be the new king. It's a seven years question. No, but for the speech, it's it's a, it? if you think that the speech was built to achieve the goal, yeah. So, what is the goal that the, the speech tried to achieve? Because uh, if you don't have, have nothing, uh, I'm just looking. This is what we call a very good question, because I have a, I have a slide about it. Um, what was the bottom line? What did Joseph want it? Now you can see that, like Rav Shapta said, there are two options. First of all, perhaps he just wants to finish his nightmare in the jail. Secondly, perhaps he is looking for the common good for the people of, of Egypt, because he knows that he is part of it. He's also in, 
in the jail. And they understand that if it would be a starvation, he, would he would starve again with them. So I don't know what he thought. I know what happened. And I know it was effective. And, but we do know that when you want to build a, a, a speech, you always begin from the end. Why? Because I want to know what is your bottom line. What is your bottom line? And therefore, what do you want? You don't have just to share with me thoughts and uh, emotions. You have to ask for me what should, what do you want? Yes, please. Yes. Just one, one more question. Because in 25, yes. Joseph says, Ha Elohim Ose Ha Gid. Let us share Ha Elohim Ose Gid for all. Yes, and, and when Joseph says that it's God who, who is going to interpret or, or who tells the meaning of the dreams, wouldn't it be the contrast if the following speech would be full of humane rhetorical devices? Isn't it more like Joseph is just in a very simple way telling what God means? Wouldn't that be a contrast? To Why? Well, because to, to make a speech full of humane rhetorical devices, he, he doesn't have to do that because God is just telling what the dreams are meaning. I will answer you like a good Jew with a question. Okay? Okay. <laughs> What do you think about the prophets? All the prophets who, who are bringing the, the, the word of God. I would say that... Do they need rhetorical... Uh, devices in order to convince the people? Jeremiah, for example? No, but he's trying, he, Ezekiel is, is doing performance in, in front of the people of Jerusalem. Yes, but it's more like, I think we have to make a difference between a uh, prophetic, do you say oracle? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yes, there, there must be a difference between a prophetic speech or an oracle, like, like Jeremiah, for example, and a speech like from a politician convincing want wanting to uh, it must be a difference between convincing or persuading maybe and the the, the examples that you told us are more persuading from my point of view. I think all the prophets try to convince their people. No, I didn't say I didn't say that. I'm, sometimes they just bring the the the, the word of God, right? No, they they don't have to co persuade or convince. The You, you know that this, this question for, for Christian homileticians yes. is one of the most discussed questions in the early 20th century. When Karl Barth and, and his fellows said, Karl Barth, you yeah, yeah. heard of him, said, uh, we, we have to say the word of God, actually, nachsagen, to say the word of God, um, and no rhetorics. That was, no rhetoric. No rhetoric. No. <laughs> that, was what, that was his basic claim in these 1920s. And, and what in the, in the meantime, of course we know that... So how, does that, how do you explain that all the acts that, that Jesus, for example, did in Jerusalem yeah, in trying I'm, to... I'm, I'm, and he used I'm, I'm all, all these devices and all I'm these... On, I'm on your side in this, in this context. He's going to the courtyard of the Temple Mount and, and he's uh, open... And the, he's the, doing the point was that they, that they meant, of course, that there is the danger of some kind of I'm trying to persuade people of what I think, whereas a good preacher always has to to show what, what God's opinion may be. And so in the last years... Should it be a contradiction? Wait a minute. No, no. In the last years we saw clearly that it's no contradiction. Because whenever we open our mouth, it's rhetoric. Whenever we open our mouth, it can just be bad rhetoric or good rhetoric. So this trying to escape from rhetoric in order to say God's word is an illusion. Always an illusion. You can't escape rhetoric. So I'm completely on your side. It's, it's, but, uh, but Moses was a, a bad speaker. He's a, a very speaker. speaker. The, the, the father of all prophets. Right. And my money is explaining why. And he said that the main reason is that people won't think that people went after Moses just because the beauty of his speech, but because of the content of what he said. And it's very hard to listen to someone who is a bad speaker. Probably you took a few courses in the university so you can understand what I'm saying, what I'm talking about. Yes? Yes, but this example, but Joseph is not giving us a sermon, so, yeah. we, have to, so we have to make a difference, I think. And he, from my point of view, he's just telling me what the dream, what the dream, what's the meaning of the dream, so it's not a sermon. And even if it's a sermon, I think 
Yes, it's like it's more like prophetic, and it, like the prophets, they are more creating pictures to make clear what God says, and not. He like, wasn't invited as no, a but, prophet. But I think it's it. Well, I just think it's very difficult to to compare, for example, the the prophet speech with the prophet uh, with the speech of a politician. Right. Even though the, the atoms of the speech are the same. But Sometimes the, the you can analyze a prophecy the same way you can analyze yes. the speech of Churchill or Obama. Yeah. Yes, but the aim is different. The aim is different. Sometimes it's not the same. The, the main aim is the same aim. Do what I want you to do. But again, yes. Follow my ideas. Just a second. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, but the politicians want to convince the people from their own aims and giving a sermon or like this. It's not about what Joseph wants. What Jesus wanted? Yes. What Jesus wanted, yes. for example? An agenda, of course. Everybody brought an agenda. When Jesus is going to the synagogues in the Galilee, what is he trying to do? But why can't he just say what God told him? What? Because we are, also, we are readers of this text. So whoever wrote this text also wants it to be written in an interesting way so that, that, that the readers also won't find it a boring... A boring history, but uh, or a boring story, but um, that will be um, um, thrilling to read it. No, I understand what I am understanding what is interpreting you because you say, listen, you are taking the prophet and you analyze him like he was a, a, a local politician. No, I don't like that because the prophets are like 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 poetry or like creating pictures to to lead us into what God maybe meant. Or With no agenda. To, to describe without it. an agenda. Without yeah, using without, rhetorical without, devices. Without a humane agenda. Yes, I think the, the, yeah. the because okay, so so they are the messenger. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. The, yeah. so yeah. that. The messenger, the, the, the message, the and, and there is an agenda. The God has an agenda, isn't it? Yes, but the politicians are not the messengers. Right. Of the idea. But maybe, uh, uh, you, you hear what they say? What, what you mean? <coughs> what is your name? Anna. 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 Like, you see, you've heard what, what Douglas said just No, sorry. That there is a bigger idea, and they are the messenger of the bigger idea. They are both the messengers of, of great ideologies. For example, yes, what, what Anne, the difference Anne wants to make, if I understand you correctly, is the difference between a rhetoric of persuasion and yes. a rhetoric of opening people up for hearing God's word in maybe a multiplicity of ways fitting to them. Yes. And that would be, a, that would be for me as a preacher, really important. If I try to have a narrow logic of persuasion or if I try to open something up by speaking which gives God the possibility of saying his own word. So, so I think that's the point she is. Why do you open them as a preacher, as a pastor? Why do you open the heart and the mind of your people? In, or, yeah, in order to initiate them to do some good actions, isn't it? It's not about functionality, it's actually why. It's what? Also persuasion. No. <laughs> no you're, what you're doing it, what you're doing is just as is, is just as reductive as what as what you're blaming him for doing because you're reducing it to, to the. She's aesthetic. not blaming me. No, she is to the aesthetic. <laughs> you're reducing this to the aesthetic to some pure, um, 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 unencumbered uh, um, feeling or connecting or conceptual. Um, expression that um, rhetoric will only will only sully, mm -hmm. and you're seeing rhetoric as something that, to begin with, is something that oh, that's the thing that those politicians do, well, and anything else is okay. Well, no, but I think I just want to 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 make clear that there are some dangers in that, and that it's not like rhetoric is. So you have to be very careful, and, and I'm very very thankful for what Sadiq says because that was exactly my point. I think that's a difference, and you can't just compare what what the prophet says to what a politician says because they. Yeah, but, but sometimes when you compare it, you may discover a lot of interesting things, and that that would be my point. That by comparing it, you will see well maybe it's it's just political. Maybe Joseph is acting, and that would be interesting, <coughs> like a politician would do because of course he has an agenda and he wants something to happen, and he 
speaks in a certain way. So, so I would say it's always worthwhile comparing, and then maybe you may find find out something, but something new. Want to For example, when Jesus tells parables, when Jesus tells parables, it's really striking because usually people don't understand them. Usually people don't understand them. So you can say Jesus was a crazy rhetorist in some sense. And in some sense he really was. It was unexpected. It was unexpected. Right. He didn't have a clear conclusion. He had in some times, especially in his parables, no proposal for the people. But he just finished and said, well, that's the parable. But people and went home and they had to rethink the course of their life. Yes. And this, is, this is the main goal of any preacher. Right. Of any pastor, any rabbi, any imam, and any politician. Yeah, that's the to point. initiate the people. So when, when Lenin is, is promoting his people, it's the same thing like Churchill is trying to promote his people. But by one more sentence, is it really the aim of the politician? The aim of the politician would be to convince people of my agenda. No. No, no not at all. No, not I mean there are put Have to look at politi political no, no, speeches. No, 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 no. It's, it's the questions of what what think about what political speeches is here, it's very clear. So if you write what Netanyahu was doing in front of the uh, United Nations, there was a clear goal. That's you can it. read Martin Luther King, what he was giving, I have a dream, was not a sermon, it was a political speech. You have of Churchill, you have of people who try to convince other people that socialism is the only way of thinking. It's not only a certain aim. That's a religious I speech. It's a big, it's a big idea. Mm -hmm. but, but then we are talking it, about this other kind of rhetoric. Right. We shouldn't generalize. Yeah, there that's are political point, speeches yeah. as well, which yeah. open something up. Right. And there are sermons as well. Where yes, they are very, which are very right. Like, right. So, and we should not make it too easy. And I find it hard to. to yeah. I find it hard to split between yeah. the religious and the the political. I'm so sorry for yeah. that. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. There is there is a point uh, when you speak to a king. At least at least of speaks uh, talks about another times. To say you are very brilliant, since you are good people, you definitely want to do the good thing. You know, to to where uh, this is the next speech the, that uh, delivered the by Judah that I want to show you. What? This is the next speech, the opening of the next speech delivered by Judah to Joseph. Yes, but but this is also here, and this is something something very very similar to what politicians do, what Churchill did. And he says twice, Asher Ayokim will say, in the Pharaoh, and they think he didn't get it right. You are a person that God speaks to. You are a wealthy person. You are a king, and you are a king that God talks to. Since you are the person that God talks to him, you should listen to God's speech. So what a, it, it's your greatness that, that God speaks to. That's why he repeats it again and again, that, that you are very important. And, and uh, I actually just explained to you what God told you, and you would have known anyway if you would if you think about it. And uh, and this is something which is very similar to church. You think you're the British, you have, you have a history of freedom and all this, and that's why you should you should take this fight. Very nice. Yes, please. But I how we can say that uh, that you can analyze uh, the profits. And the uh, politician the same way in, in their rhetoric because uh, the you, you, can't, mental state. you can't hear them, okay? You can you can be a, a Bible teacher and, and read for your students the, uh, the the right things, okay? With a uh, with a strong voice, with a the only thing that is that you write in the one you are right only in one third because they don't have the pathos. I do know the pathos and I do know the lago the logos. And I can read it, and I can and I can understand why God is sending Ezekiel to deliver his speech and to make some performance in front of the people of Jerusalem. Why is just not standing there and just delivering his speech? Period. Yes. And yeah. when you are analyzing prophecies and you are checking how it was built, what is the logos? What wanted Jeremiah from the people of Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem? He wanted to initiate them, to do some good things, to prevent the destruction of Jerusalem and the first temple. He wanted them, and he delivered a speech. And you can see that he tried to do it. And the same thing you can see in many other prophets. So the atoms are the same atoms. Now, the only difference is who is using them? 
Sometimes, prophets, prophet, prophets did it. Sometimes, I'm sorry to tell you, politicians you took it. And therefore, we cannot analyze the prophets in the way that politicians are working. I'm not saying that he is coming with a personal agenda. Jeremiah didn't bring his personal agenda. He didn't have to take, to take care for himself. He was, he was taking care for the people of Jerusalem. And he did it not because he wanted his personal interest, but he did it with tools or using formulas that we using until today. Yes, this. Maybe just one more aspect to make, make my point a little bit more clear. Um, for example, polit politicians, when they... In a speech of a politician, it's about the people have to understand what's it, his program and what he wants so that they can think about, well, am I going to vote for him or not? Or do I like that or not? And a prophet or, or someone who's giving a sermon, it's not about understanding, maybe. The rhetoric is good in the sermon, but not to the aim that the people understand. They don't want them to understand, but to, to, to open it up and to make it possible that maybe God can, can speak or can, can make something happen. And it's not about understanding, and I think that's the difference. Yeah, yes, Please do. Uh, so uh, the thing, uh, the thing is, may, maybe I'll, I'll try to answer uh, 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 to both of you, and especially because I said, oh, maybe, maybe that's something that's dangerous, and uh, in a way it can, it, it can be. But when we are trying to do a rhetorical analysis, we are basically trying. We are basically consider well, we have a speech that tries to achieve something. That's like some basic premise. Okay, you have the speech to try to achieve something. This something can be achieved through all kinds of different ways. Whenever you are giving a rhetorical, any speech that tries to achieve something, at the end of the day, whoever is listening to you, whoever you are trying to convince, will either accept it and reject it. And you'll say, well, but then they can just manipulate people and uh, 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 try to, to put whatever I want. Yeah, but then you have other levels that you can add to that, that uh, you can also analyze. You can have a speech that's my only goal. For example, we are having a vote uh, 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 of uh, if everybody should eat pizza. I can argue that because I want everybody to eat pizza. And I can try to convince you just to get you to say, yeah, I want it. Uh, uh, everybody's going to eat pizza, but the pizza is really horrible because I want to have you that you I want you to have a bad experience. Yes, but the politician at the end, the politician wants that every, that everyone would buy his pizza. Yeah, and in the, in no, the sermon, not necessarily. Not necessarily. But, not necessarily. But, again, but, but in the sermon, it's about thinking how the pizza might look like, and not and if you want it or not, it's really. Decision. But then again, even if you are going like to to go deep into <laughs> the content and analyze it and so on, still you have a stage before that that you just try, uh, you can try to look at rhetorical speech, speeches as speeches that have a semblance to, 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 to reality or to truth, even though it might not be. Okay, I would like to listen to more other ideas. Yes, please. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you made your point. <laughs> uh, we have a chaos by now. Because um, I, I would like to make a different uh, difference between uh, theological speech and the po political speech. The politicians want to convince people to trust in the politicians, to trust in them. On their idea. On the, the ideas, but the they are uh, fulfilled, they are going to fulfill the ideas in the social um, uh, system. The theologians, the theologians, preachers, the uh, pastors, rabbis, they want to proclaim uh, gospel, I mean the God, and to trust not in themselves, but in God. Yeah. And that, that's that was your point. I May I ask you a question? What is we need to make a different difference between these two, for me, that's the pizza is not making the, 
it's not the topic of the sermon. Pizza is not the topic <laughs> let me throw, of the sermon. Let me throw just another question to the table, okay? Just one more question. What is the difference, Sebastian and Anne? What is the difference between a comforting prophecy by a prophet and a comforting speech by a political leader after a bad battle leading by him? They are trying to comfort the people for a national trauma. But then you don't need a God. You don't need a God. So why, so why the, the prophets are trying to are delivering comforting uh, prophecies? Yes, I, I can answer. Firstly, we need to make a differentiation. Like when the politician is saying uh, about idea of uh, I don't know to uh, to overcome poverty. He is a politician, but when he is speaking about the God will uh, make the people, uh, feed the people, he is a theologian, even if he is a formal politician. His speech is theologic, has a theological character. When Martin Luther King Jr. He is more delivering his speech for very good the example. rights of the Afro-American citizens, he is a theological or political leader? He, in that case, he is more political leader. So it's that I would disagree. Yes, please. But I mm -hmm. have a different point. Okay. I think that what Anna is trying to say, or what Anna said, and what I completely disagree with, what I completely agree with, or what I want to support is. <laughs> louder. Please louder. When giving prophecy, or when giving, uh, when we're preaching, it's not about agreement at all. It doesn't matter if people agree to that, and say yes or no. It's a whole different concept whole different level. But political speech more than often is about agreement or disagreement. And people can say yes or no to that. That's not the point of the sermon. It's not the point of the prophecy. Can you be a shepherd without sheep? Can you deliver a speech to a congregation that is lefty? But the prophets face that that's a problem. That sometimes sometimes prophets were sent to jail just because of People didn't like what they said. Because it's not what it's the about. people of Jerusalem almost lynched yeah, sure. Jeremiah because they didn't like his exactly. messages. Exactly our point. It's not about so they listened to him, but they disagreed with him, and they almost lynched him. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if there were any people. So but it's, just uh, that supports my case. Yeah. And therefore, and therefore, what is your bottom line? There is a difference between a political speech and a prophecy and or forming you now. When, when, the 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 story, when they might experience, for when example, like slides. God is in the sermon, and that's why it's a great sermon, and then they could stay, but it's not something, it's not because I'm so convincing or persuading them. I'm sorry, aren't you thinking, aren't you talking about a very idealized theological speech and a very bad cliche of political speech? Because I think you can't just say, oh, all the politicians only want to be voted again, and they don't have any morals and any agenda which is above their personality, and all the pastors only want to deliver the gospel, or all the rabbis only want to deliver a godly message, because I think it's just not true. I think politicians... No, no, no. Yeah, but I think you can't... Yes, but I, I don't think it's correct to call it political or theological speech, because they are also... Um, pastors who are trying to convince people of their own personality, so it's and they are also... It's not a sermon, exactly. Yeah. It's not a sermon. But could be a, a political leader who is using prophecies oh, yeah. and prophetical like tools. Martin, like Martin Luther King did, so I wouldn't say it was a speech. <coughs> it was a son of a preacher, you know? I think Only we exclusive. see it in chapter 41, actually. I, yes, now I think, I think the, the dreams of the Pharaoh are prophetical. And what Joseph says about them is clearly the political aspect. Because he commands uh, the practical orders that follow from the prophecy. It doesn't depend on if the Pharaoh um, does not understand his own dreams because he cannot understand Adonai or something. But uh, because of he's an Egyptian. But Joseph just does the following political actions from 
the prophets. Even if he's but any about prophet, God, even is, is any prophet about tried to make a significant uh, change in the society. Prophets were talking in the palaces of kings. They tried to challenge the kings. When Nathan is coming and giving his prophecy, or right, he's giving his proverb to, to King David. But the, is it? Just a second. I see that I am lighting you. Just a second. Is it political? Is it, is it he's trying to promote an agenda? Right. He, he's asking from David to, to be aware to his, to his act and to the effects of his, his act. Obviously. Now you can lynch me. Yes, please. we don't have an ontological politician, we don't have an ontological theologian, we have a uh, so called Auszagen. Uh, the speeches are on the theological character and the or political character. You said, oh, prophets, which prophets? Give me an example of speech of, I don't know, uh, Ezekiel or uh, uh, Jeremiah. Did what? And we can sh uh, follow the text if there is a more politic or Yeah, there is a practical, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a practical uh, aspect yeah, of, a, of the prophecy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. on, on a, some kind of a meta level. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that, but, but I think we, yeah. we really have two different agendas now on the table. Right. There are people who want to convince Surian or others that there is a big difference between theology and politics. And maybe that's not the point we are in now. And you, <laughs> and you just want to show us what it means if we compare rhetorics and what we learn from rhetorics with what we read in the Bible. And actually, for at least a moment, I would like to follow your way a little more because you prepared a little more. And, and not to <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what you want to show us is, is a practical aspect of how we can analyze what we can see and what we can analyze when we, when we, when we read when we see what rhetorical theory tells us and when we compare it to what the Tadakh says about Joseph's speeches on the, the... And this is what I would like to at least follow for a moment more because I think the point we are making here is quite relevant and interesting to, to ask about the general aspect, but maybe, maybe we should continue a little bit more on this way, which is absolutely legitimate to ask what we can see and learn when we compare it to general rhetorics and to have it here. So that would be my, my point on a meta level oh. if I, I, I know that there are a lot of... So another comment here. for uh, Dagmar and then I will... Yeah. Another comment on the meta level without going into that discussion. I find it totally shocking and disturbing that no one asked the question if there was a political way of preaching also, politische Predigt of German. That's shocking me, that you all make the distinction that preaching is one and politics is one. If a church is not going in certain circumstances, that's not true. That's not how I heard it. Yeah, yeah that's not true. Hopefully. <laughs> I know these people from my seminar, and that's absolutely not true. Hopefully. That's not the case. Okay, so let's continue. Let's continue. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Yeah, you wanted to say something, right? Uh, I just. People who didn't speak. This is, this is. I would go again into the discussion and bring another example of a political speech that is also that, uh, that has religious elements uh, that are uh, that are like uh, as theology, uh, like Islamist. So we, we agreed not to continue we should, this. We should, we should, we should okay. after so. Uh, as mentioned before, Churchill was a great uh, speaker, but he also won the Nobel Prize for, who knows, for literature. And, and he said once, I know how the history is going to look like, because I'm writing it. And I think that this is another aspect, and the book of Genesis is a book of stories. And in the stories, the The, the book of stories. There, there is, uh, there are a few dreams, and there are a few speeches that are based on stories. And for example, this is another speech that delivered by Judah to Joseph. Now, people think that while well, we know story is a tool to make people to fall asleep, right? It's a bedtime story, and actually. Story tried to simplify, to simplify theories. Stories 
are being brought in order to make us understand better things about ourselves and about other things. And the, the good storyteller can initiate again. He's not opening just the mind and the heart of the listeners, but he is doing it in an agenda, in a, in, a, in a right and focused reason, because he wants to initiate the people to follow him, to accept his ideas. Now, when I'm telling you a story, you would like to listen. And we, by the way, we are all storytellers. We are all. The Bible is full with stories. We are now just argued about so many stories that happened in, in the book of Genesis, the book of Jeremiah, and, and, other, uh, and other books in, in, um, in the New Testament. I mean, we can find that there are so many stories around us. Now, the first speech that is telling us a, a story is the speech delivered by Judah. Please open Genesis chapter 44, phrase 18. Actually, Judah is now trying to summarize and to explain uh, Joseph what happened. <coughs> but this is the art of the storytelling. And I'm telling you, this is the art of a good speaker and a brilliant speaker. <coughs> now, if you know how to tell a story, you are the king of the jungle. You are riding the tiger. All the jungle is listening to you. But if you don't know how to tell a story, the tiger will eat you, nobody will find anything, not even the bones. So, same thing that happens here. When Judah is approaching to Joseph, and he's telling him the story, he's not telling him the story. And he's not writing him the history, he rewrites the story, and, by the way, his story. His story. And he's telling his story from a different point of view. And like Rav Shabta mentioned before, when Joseph is approaching to Pharaoh, he's saying, you are, you are a very unique king. God is speaking to you. So you have to listen to what God is telling you through the dreams. The same thing happened when Judah is coming to Joseph and said, you are like Pharaoh. You are... You are, high, uh, you are a deputy, but actually we all know who is running the business. And then he is telling him as follows in chapter 19. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you have a father or a brother? What were, let's see if what you remember, what were the first words that the brothers heard from Joseph. In their first first meeting in Egypt. What? You are spies. You are spies. But he erased it from the history. And he is telling the history from a, a new point of view. He deleted what he didn't want. Very frankly. <laughs> Very frankly. And why? Because he began to, de to prepare the speech from the end. Now, I don't know why Anne and Sebastian are thinking about me right now, but after all, there is a bottom line, there is an agenda, there is a purpose. Why Judah is delivering this speech? What does he want? One thing. He wants Benjamin with him. Period. The rest is not... Like Clark Gable said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. The rest, I don't give a damn. I want just one thing. I want Benjamin. Now, I have to think, what would bring the deputy of Pharaoh, who has one million reasons not to listen to me, and even if he is listening to me, not to be convinced by me, how do I convince him? Just a second. Let me just put the idea, and then you can lynch me, okay? Now, <laughs> feel free. Now, in order to do so, and in order to understand that this is the bottom line, bring with me Benjamin. Send him out of the jail. And because he understood that this is the bottom line, he built the story 
on the way that he would push again and again on the emotional, most sensitive parts in the soul of Joseph. Do you remember you asked us, do you have a brother or a father? And we told you we have a father, but he's a very old father. And he already lost one son. And then now he's about to, to, to lose another son. Are you not a merciful king? Don't you have some mercy on us? Now, there are some threads that you may find among the lines. That he's saying, guys, we will take him. No matter what. But first of all, I'm asking for you. I'm begging for you. Please let me have him. And in order to get to the bottom line, he built the argument. And he explained. And he's telling this story, an emotional story. He is not now trying to justify what happened. He is not trying to convince we are not spies. He is not trying now to, to uh, set the table like we are in sitting in the court. He is setting the table like we are people. And we are equal. And the same thing, probably you have also a father. Probably you also have small kids, young kids. Probably you are taking care of them. Don't you care about our father? And by the way, here we can see that the same thing happens in the... Uh, and he's saying, what would happen if I would come, and I would come, and I would say to my old father that there is not, that he is, a God, he is about to lose his next son. And Benjamin would not want come with me. What can I say to him? And, and you can see the last, the, the closing sentence that opening with uh, the closing sentence of this speech is uh, a phrase 34. What is the last thing in this speech? The speech is ending with a question. How can I come back home and tell to my father, you lost another son? I'm not answering, I'm, I'm asking. And then you can see, this is the opening of chapter 40, 45. Joseph is collapsing under the pressure. And you can see how effective is this speech. Now you can see that I, Judah came with an agenda. He wanted to initiate Joseph to one specific focused action. And eventually, Benjamin is, is being released. Yes, I just want to say, I totally agree in this case, totally, because that's not a sermon, that's not like the, a revelation of God, it's a topic between the family members trying to get this... The between two strangers, home. by the way. Yes, but it's not like in the dreams where he says, well, God can tell you how the dreams are, or giving a sermon, that's just like discussing in a family, and of course this could be like... A, speech and oh, arguments and rhetorical devices <coughs> human affairs totally humane it's just a people will tell you that also the family story that we read in the book of Genesis is also everything is the message from the Lord so what will we say yes everything is the, is the message from the Lord but there's no it's, it's, it's a difference between a narration or or humane aspects you have to put on a bigger level to see it as a message from the Lord or direct sermons or di direct revelations. Or but, but, but how do revelations work? They work in structures of, of human, human uh, Tools. communications. So human language, as in the moment as God re reveals himself, he has to use the tools that we use when we talk to each other. Otherwise, Otherwise not How do you bring God those... Where is he? Pardon? Where is God here? In this chapter? In this speech from Gibbon? I can tell you where. When you have to live... Now you are sitting with the scripture and you say, this is an holy scripture. Eventually you understand that there is a lesson that we have to learn from this story. Otherwise, we had only Book of Commandments. Do A, B, C, D. Why God is telling us stories? No, I, Why are you wasting our time 
in his time by telling us stories. Why we are telling our sub stories for over 3,000 years? Yes. Yes, but I think that's the difference. Experiencing, experiencing God, for example, in my personal life or what, what I do in, in my everyday life and giving a sermon, for example. Because, of course, in a, in a generation or in a usual, I don't know, of course I can experience God, but in, in a very different a very different um, yes of course that's possible but there's a difference between them two when a pastor is trying to try to, to, to convince me when a person when a pastor mm -hmm. is delivering a sermon yes. is he using is he using like they asked is he using human tools in order to bring the, 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 the gospel yes of course but to bring the gospel. And is, what is this here? Do they, do they have... And where do, you, and where do you bring you the gospel from? Well, from stories. You, sometimes from stories. Yes, and that's beautiful. Absolutely right. But do they discuss here because they want to show what God wants? I think yes. The answer is, the, the answer is positive, yes. But direct or indirect? Mostly indirect. Yes. Because and, yes, and the pastor this is, is why we are telling for yes. this is why the human kind is telling himself stories. Yes, and when the pastor is giving the sermon, does he want indirectly? Show when the pastor is telling the story to his congregation, yes, is it an indirect or direct way to deliver a message? Well, he can, can only wrong, wrong, wrong question. Wrong quick, wrong question. Okay. Another way. Should you so put it in the right way? Uh, I have a problem with uh, politician uh, sermons because a uh, politician <laughs> sermon, as you mentioned, it's in, in Poland, in po our context, it's a very like uh, the Roman Catholics priests, they yeah. are preaching to convince people uh, to uh, vote uh, peace party, this, this conservative party. Okay. So it's a, uh, they are putting emphasize, uh, they are emphasizing, they are emphasizing the the politician aspect and the politic and so on and they are convincing people into one only one party so I have a problem with so-called politicians sermon but I know that uh, we there is no doubt that we should talk to people in their own context and about their own problems social problems so there is a different thing a uh, social area or social aspect and political aspect, aspect of policy, because policy is is, uh, is going to how they, they should rule, how they should uh, resolve the problems. But Sebastian, you are coming one way. Mm -hmm. are, when you are entering and you are delivering a sermon, yeah, you are coming with an agenda. You can tell, you can tell it, you can tell me, you can tell yourself, you can tell all of us. Yeah. But it's a it's a goddess uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. It's an agenda, yeah, right? Yeah. And people will ask you. What is your good advice? And you will tell them a story. And there will be a lesson from that story. Don't you use the human tools in order to, yeah, to initiate okay. them to take an action? It's okay, but it's a pro I have a problem when the, uh, mm, the pastor or uh, a priest saying directly, uh, we should vote th to this party and so on. Uh, it's, it's a problem, yeah? So Sebastian, I have to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. Do you okay. think the gospel is apolitical? Uh, apolitical? No, I didn't say it. So, so then how can you give... Very good political answer. Yes, so then, so then how can you give a sermon without in some way being political? It's a I mean, being political is not only telling what, people what who you, to vote. To vote. It's okay, what does it mean every for time you? The, being mean, political. Is so this actually our question? No. no. It's a rather it's statement. Not. I wouldn't say it's, it's not. No. What? I would say it's not. Our it's not. question is not talking about if a sermon can be political or not. No, no. but I can, I can tell you just one thing, one thing in continuing to your question. I've read an article biography of uh, a commander in the SAS, the Special Air Service, uh, special units that worked in, in Iraq. And they were in, in the Iraq desert. And one of the colleagues of the commander said that he's so bored, they're in the middle of the desert, they have nothing to read. So said, listen, I have a very good book about wars and politics and conspiracies. Would you like to, uh, to read? He said, yes, yeah, sure. So he gave him a Bible. 
the Bible is full with politics and wars and conspiracies and ideas and there is an agenda there is an agenda in telling us the fact that there is a whole book of Genesis who is telling us a specific story I have one family what was the of one of dynasty he is telling us guys this is what you have to learn we just a year ago we learned together in Lutherstadt about the binding of Isaac why to focus the, the the mind of the humankind on a specific event that happened in, uh, on the mountain somewhere, somehow, in the far distance history. Because this story has a meaning. Yes. Yes, maybe that's one more point. Because I would say, when you understand to be political, like to have to do with the polis or with the city where you live in or with the society, then of course every sermon is in a way political. Mm -hmm. And that's totally okay. And, and using rhetorical devices is good as well. But I think the difference is a politician is in this inner circle of the polis, so he tries to, to do something humane in this inner circle by giving a sermon. Of course, it can be political and it can use rhetorical devices, but always to break out of this inner circle and to, show, to point on the, on the leg to point on the to point on God to hope that, that God does something and not to stay in this inner domain. But that's a very pure view of politics. A very or naive. Pure. You want to say naive? No. Pure? pure? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Is there for what I've heard is the real distinction really if, if it's political or theolog uh, theological or don't both genres uh, have a distinction within themselves? Mm -hmm. Because the it's, it's about, this is a thesis, maybe it's yeah. not about if it's political or theological, it's about the goal, what we call mm -hmm. in German the, the goal is important. Yes. And this can be in, in both genres. You can have, for example, if you have Obama after the uh, Charleston Town Massacre, yes. we try to unify the nation again. This is a political speech, but it serves a greater good and it enables people to be reconciled again with the situation. And yes, you can yes, also yes. have a misuse, <laughs> and you can also have a misuse, as you pointed out, in political preaching, where the goal is for a certain part. So it's really about the goals. It's fake, it's fake, as we say in German, and not the, the German. So it's going about this open aspect and the very na narrow aspect yeah. to, to vote on a special party. In but the, that's, yeah, but yeah. that's what I, I know in Poland. I, I don't know. And how do I see mm -hmm. the other? Do Is he a tool for myself? Do I want to convince him or do I want to enable him? Or to by the way, open the, the perspective. By the way, uh, what, what's your name? Being. Zonia. <coughs> Zonia is mentioned. I really, really recommend you to see the eulogy delivered by President Obama after the shooting in Charleston. It's a 30 minutes, and Obama is like a Methodist preacher. And he's talking, and you can see that there is a specific word that he's repeating again and again. He's talking about the grace that what happened, that the grace that the, the church gave to the to the black slaves, to the black citizens, and that was shot in that, by that racist in Charleston. It's, a, it's an amazing eulogy, amazing. And what can I say? Obviously, it's the President of the United States, but he was delivering a speech that any pastor in the Methodist Church would be able to deliver, with no, no difference. By the way, how, uh, what about the time? Uh, what well, you are the well, most of the time. Well, we are well, in the mind. We are okay. over time. So please, Rob, shop time. One point, I think that political speech and prophecy and false prophecy and sermons and anything, there's one thing in common. Uh, and I think it's quite neglected. I, I didn't hear it from him. A good, a good speech is a speech where you really create the feeling that you expose your soul, that you reveal your inner truth, and you did not pretend. So the best preacher or the best politician he pretends to not pretend, if you understand what I mean, right? And the prophet does not pretend. And you know, you know what is the what is the test of the perfect, perfect speech? And Yehuda was wrong. He ain't, he ain't, when he shot, he shot at the deputy king of Egypt that doesn't know the family, was crazy, a maniac that thought that they are, they are spies, and cooked up the whole paranoia, paranoia story about spies, and then he wants to see the little boy for crazy reason. Who is standing in for him? Joseph. Joseph is 
brother that knows that he's lying, that he's telling that they want to die, that they like the father. He knows it's actually the wrong listener completely. If I take the points of the purpose of the speech, and the listener, there is the, the wrong listener for this speech. <laughs> the, the, the listener should have said, you are a lying person, you are lying, everything is a lie, and everything is just a trick. I am not the person. The only thing that worked, if it worked, if we assume that Joseph was really convinced, collapsed, and planted pretense, so it's only because of one thing. The Judah revealed his inner thought, his inner truth. He did not keep that. That's the only thing. The, otherwise, the speech was a total failure. The only thing is that he showed his inner truth, but he's not with them. And I think that it's, this is the common thing between a politician and a prophet and a rabbi and a, and a preacher. You either speak from you, from you, they say it in Hebrew, from your buttonhole, or you speak from your heart. And, and once you convince people that you speak from your heart, it does not matter what 